Welcome, everyone. I'm, my name is Horst von Rakem. I'm a professor of biomedical engineering at Case Western Reserve University. And it's my honor and privilege to uh, introduce you to the Open BME seminar series. In that time, and that continues, but I'll just go back and forth in time a little bit, uh, hypertension. Hypertension is a huge global challenge that we have. So how are we going to target it? It, it so happens that 1.13, 1. 1 billion people have hypertension. But one out of five do not know they have it. So this is really important. And of course, the blood pressure measurement machine, somebody will say it is a very easy device. It should be available everywhere. Well, no, it is not available everywhere. And it is uh, in some countries is still on uh, um, using mercury and mercury should be banned out of all healthcare uh, services. Uh, actually, it's very contaminant. So we developed technical specifications for blood pressure measurement devices. And now that was uh, a, a year ago, we launched the book and now it is available. So we're giving some guidance to the biggest problems. Then we have another one, huge challenge. 5 billion people, yes, you heard, you heard correctly, 5 billion people lack access to safe and affordable surgery. And this was um, a statement by the Lancet Commission on Global Surgery. So yeah, surgery is there, but people suffer or they have um, um, uh, problems either after or, or cut, uh, cut an infection, or it was not safe enough, or it was not affordable. We have a number one killer of, of children for less than five years old, it's the pneumonia. And pneumonia is still there. So what can we do to face pneumonia? Well, first of all, we need in vitro diagnostics to, to diagnose if it is bacterial or, or viral pneumonia. We need oxygen support systems. And in 2019, along with UNICEF, we developed the technical specifications for um, uh, oxygen therapy devices. And the idea was really to support, increase the availability of oxygen as an essential medicine in the world. So we're, we're continue to work on different aspects. Another one in 2019 that was major was uh, patient safety. So many, um, four out of 10 patients are harmed in primary and ambulatory care settings. So there was a call from Dr. Tedros and for the member states saying, we really need to ensure that safe care is a, it's a major challenge. And we need to ensure that uh, with innovation, we make sure that um, uh, patient safety is uh, number one. Um, it's really concerned. In December, 2019, I was with some colleagues in the US in a meeting trying to define innovative PPEs for Ebola protection. And the pictures that are here is because we were in that meeting trying to define what would be the suits for, for Ebola. All this was happening in December 2019, and then the end of December, all of a sudden, COVID came. Everything changed. We, we still have the non-communicable diseases, we still have the infectious diseases, we still have lack of oxygen, we still have challenges with PPEs, and then Ebola came to our lives. So due, why is the world small? Because due to our interconnected small world, infection has spread. Now we have 2.5 million lives lost. And this is the map in the right hand uh, with orange. And then we have 111 million cases of COVID. This is a major issue. How are we going to face it? So just last year, we dedicated to develop technical specifications for PPEs for COVID uh, to prevent, to, to, to protect healthcare workers. So just so that you have an idea with the specifications that we did, and that is the slide on the, on the left hand, we uh, WHO purchased uh, 476 million PPE products, and they were sent to 180 countries. UNDP, UNICEF, UNOPS, WHO, uh, they all help. They all help support and they all help sending uh, PPE and personal protective equipment and then showing them how it should be used or not and how to uh, ensure to save the lives of healthcare workers. And still, that is not, that's still a challenge. Okay, now we are here. We are buying medical engineers. 
And what is our role? Well, our role is to design, to evaluate, to regulate, and manage all medical devices to support local, regional, and global health. And as you can see from the photos that I took here, it's everywhere. There's an emergency room, there's the neonatal, there is a, a, a nice, uh, uh, a very advanced laboratory for cancer research. Uh, uh, there is lack of oxygen, so we have to use these tanks. This is a hemodialysis unit in Yemen, uh, a, a glucometers, uh, emergency care, and mobile clinics. So where, where are we going to work as a biomedical engineer? We need to help all those different settings. And we have to keep in our mind those settings. So, and what is, what is the type of medical devices that I will be working on if I'm a, a, a biomedical engineer? Well, the range is really diverse. We have about, some people say 7,000, others 10, 20,000. Well, we have more than 10,000 different types of medical devices. And that includes all medical equipment, all medical softwares, medical device, single-use medical devices, all the surgical instruments, implantable devices, all the in vitro diagnostics, and we as biomedical engineers need to know the physiology, the biochemistry, the medical instrumentation, the sensors, uh, etc., to make sure that we know about them. So, where are the biomedical engineers? Well, many people use, when I go to different countries, as uh, uh, Rob, uh, Robert Andrew was saying, when we were in Uganda, many people tell me, oh no, Adriana, there are no biomedical engineers around the world. And then we demonstrated, yes, there are many biomedical engineers all around the world. Uh, we have uh, all these countries have at least one biomedical engineering professional association by uh, WHO region. So we have 50% uh, of them are in the Americas, but we also have in Africa, in, 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 in the Eastern Mediterranean, in Europe, and even in Southeast Asia. And this is, this is the map. This map was developed 2015, 2017, and now we are updating it. But as you can see, Southeast Asia, uh, Europe, uh, Latin America, and even some countries in, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, they all have some programs of biomedical engineering in the university. So this is expanding now. So we are trying to get more biomedical engineers all around the world. So the idea is if we take those biomedical engineers and then we uh, ask them to design, manage, regulate medical devices. What we can do together is really impact local, regional, and global health. So now, how can we achieve that? Well, we are the ones that are responsible to ensure improved access of safe, good quality, affordable, available, accessible, acceptable medical devices. So. On one on side, we have some biomedical engineers that work in industry, they do research and development, they, they, and uh, that's one um, set, and that is with the red. Then we have others that do the selection. So those are the selection, uh, like health technology assessment, trying to find the evidence of uh, the, the yeah, review of evidence uh, of effectiveness of, uh, of a device. Then we have others that work like um, exactly what Andrew was talking about, the FDA, like uh, regulatory agencies to ensure that uh, the, approved, the, the devices are approved for, market, um, for marketing in countries, that they are safe and, fit and good quality. And then we have all the area about health technology management. We need to define what are the needs, how to select it, how to procure it, how to do the training, and ensure that those devices are really meeting the needs of the society and the patients. So if we take these three colors that you see here, the, the pink, the green, and the blue, I'm sorry, we should be more bluish, uh, we take, and, and this is a sequence, you regulate, you measure safety and performance, then you have the HTA, you measure clinical effectiveness, ethics, social issues, organizational, and then you go to the health technology management to ensure procurement selection training and use is correct. In many countries, they have, uh, we, we, we did a study on all these aspects from innovation, selection, procurement, uh, innovation, etc. And then we put everything together into the Global Atlas of Medical Devices. That is being updated as we speak uh, for the new release. And what we have is, for example, in this uh, map, you have which countries have a list of medical devices that is approved for procurement, reimbursement, or universal health coverage. 
which countries have a list, but it is just a recommendation, and which countries have no list, and then uh, the, the, the list needs to be defined. So where do we need the biomedical engineers? Yeah, you need them in the hospitals, you need them in the industry, but you also need them some in regulatory agencies and also at governmental level. So we, we need them to help the design and to make sure that those technologies should be matching the um, healthcare interventions that the country wants to give to its population. So we've been, since I'm in WHO, I've been 12 years. I think we have about 48 publications that we have done in that time. And I just selected uh, some of them for you now. So the Global Atlas is really uh, having the profile by country. The Green Book, on uh, it's the model regulatory framework for medical devices to help countries exactly what um, Andrew was saying. If they don't know how to regulate devices, at least this is a step-by-step -step approach. And we have other books that were developed also by the Eastern Mediterranean region on a step-by-step -step approach. Uh, then we have the human resources for medical devices. That was really to, to uh, tell the world what is our role as biomedical engineers? What can we do and how can we support countries, hospitals, industry, etc. And then we have the list that you have with the uh, yellow and um, salmon color. So it is the list of priority medical devices for reproductive, reproductive maternal, newborn and childcare. So we went through every intervention that you have to do with a, a, a newborn baby, a pregnant mother, uh, etc. And then we said, these are the interventions, clinical interventions that you have. These are the devices that you need. And where do you need it? Is it in an operating room? Is it in a, um, a, a clinic? Is it in a hospital? So we listed all of them. We listed the interventions, we listed the devices. And then we did exactly the same exercise for cancer, cancer management. And so these two books uh, contain about a thousand uh, medical devices that should be used for all these interventions. And so, well, we were working, and as I told you before, we were in 2015 doing the reproductive health, then the, then the, the cancer care, and we were developing the cardiovascular stroke and diabetes book when, when COVID arrived. And then when COVID arrived, then we paused the cardiovascular stroke and diabetes book and then we concentrated on the priority medical device list for COVID. This book was developed like in three months with an immense help from many, many organizations. And before we used to take maybe like a year to do some technical specifications like the ones that I, I, I showed you about UNICEF and WHO, we took about a year and a half to do about maybe 25. Well, I can tell you that with the help of everybody, we achieved this book in record time and we did about a hundred um, specifications in less than five months. Yeah. We also have a very important issue and I just uh, took this slide to remember that um, uh, um, uh, digital health or um, the software's medical device is really growing. It's now embedded in most of our medical devices, but we still keep some devices that are almost uh, analog or mechanic and some others that are digital and then others that we need to include between the digital systems uh, and the interface with the, with, the, with the electronic health record, personalized medicine, artificial intelligence, computer-aided diagnostics and then all that world now fall also into our resp responsibility. When, when COVID arrived, then we said, okay, we need to define what are those devices that are needed for testing, to treat patients, and to protect healthcare workers. And what is the quality and, and level of use that we need? So this slide represents the use of all those devices. And then we said, okay, for PPE, which ones we need and which are the levels of care that they need to use it? Where are the medical equipment? Where are the intensive care? and uh, the ventilators, the high flow nasal cannula, etc. Um, and then also in vitro diagnostics and all the imaging techniques. At the same time, we have the innovative technologies because now everybody has new ideas. What can we do for COVID? So we are receiving, we have received about 300 uh, innovative technologies. We are assessing them. We invite them to do a pitch presentation. We do a voting with an expert panel. We are selecting them. And we think that in the next two to three weeks, we will uh, launch the first um, 
phase of the Compendium of Innovative Technologies for uh, COVID, uh, for, for low resource settings. And then as we are reviewing that, we have received many more. So now we will have maybe in six months another, another book coming. But now we really acknowledge that for this revision, we are having expert panels of uh, PPE expert panels of respiratory um, uh, experts, clinical, um, uh, clinical care physicians from intensive care units. But we also have biomedical engineers from low and middle income countries and then uh, the Global Clinical Engineering Alliance, Euroscan, our uh, regulators to help us assess all these technologies. I just wanted to give you an idea of what do I do in a normal day. So I look into the issues about the COVID issues that are the PPE, the devices in the ICU, the oxygen, the CTAP, but the other hand, we have the non-COVID, the essential diagnostic list, the cardiac and the diabetes and the, um, uh, uh, the cancer and other things. So this is like a normal day. In the essential diagnostic list, we have the essential diagnostic that was launched just two weeks ago. And then we're trying to put together the diagnostics that should be available in, in countries. As, as we have many books, so we are now moving into a software system and we, uh, we just launched it. It was proposed for March last year, but we just launched it um, a, a month ago. You can find it in the website. It's called the EEDL. Then we took, sorry. Then we took all the priority medical devices and we said it is very difficult for people to go PDFs, download the PDF and everything. So as I told you, now this book, the priority for COVID got here in 2020 and 2021, we hope in one month to launch the cardiovascular stroke and diabetes book. But we put everything together with the help of many biomedical engineers, extraordinary people that have been helping me day and night to put all the information together so that then with a click, uh, you could find information about all the medical devices that are in these books. So the idea is that countries take these guidance, these books that are produced by WHO, they use it in their country, and then they said, okay, now we can define where in my, in my healthcare settings can I put them. On other hand, what we have to do is disseminate continuously information. So we have the medical device newsletter that I'm in charge of every month and update uh, what happens with the surveys, what new guidance, uh, new consultations, anything that's happening. And we even have still the challenge of having a name for medical devices that will be used uh, globally. So we are having sessions in the World Health Assembly to try to define what would be the best nomenclature. So that discussion is ongoing. So now I just bring you back to the first slide that I presented. Do you now remember our role? It's to design, evaluate, regulate, manage uh, medical devices that will support local, regional, and global health in any of the settings that I'm presenting here. We need to listen to the needs. And this, this is not Uganda, this is Tanzania, but we need to listen to them. We need to adapt to the settings and we need to empower the biomedical engineers locally, not to impose, but to empower. And that is something, and here I'm empowering women, biomedical engineers. And this, this uh, picture, I just took it from our last meeting and many, uh, maybe one of them is still, uh, is now listening to this conversation, but the idea is working together. All the biomedical engineers from different parts of the world to solve local, regional and global health problems. This was the 22 of February and we meet every Monday and we are at about 30, as you can see from Botswana, from Benin, from Sierra Leone, from Canada, from the US, etc, etc, etc. So take home messages, and I know most of you are home, but then I said, well, anyway, I'll leave the take home. So number one, medical devices and IBDs are indispensable for outbreaks, well-being, and universal health coverage. Number two, biomedical engineers are indispensable to design, evaluate, manage, blah, 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 medical devices. And five issues to consider. Number one, consider local, first local, then regional, then global needs. Second, consider the healthcare setting environment, which are the limitations that that environment has. Third, listen to the voice of the final users. Four, share information and look for collaboration. And fifth, to focus on the last mile. Where is the last mile? That is where the healthcare worker 
and the patient sir. So please always remember that a patient is at the end of all our activities, doesn't matter where, doesn't matter how. And they and the health workers deserve our biomedical engineering knowledge, our passion, our transparency, our hard work, and our collaboration. Thank you very much.